Welcome back, coaches. Uh, today we got a great guest for you joining us to talk offensive line play. Coach Mike Pollock from Tip of the Spear is joining us. Coach, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us more about what Tip of the Spear has to offer for our coaches. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, my name is Mike Pollock. Um, our company, Tip of the Spear, we're former NFL players, really with a mission to make the game of football safer um, without sacrificing performance. So we're a performance-based program. Um, when I got done playing, I played seven years in the NFL, played for the Colts, the the Panthers and Bengals, and kind of towards the end of my career was kind of like the height of the CTE conversation, movies like that concussion movie came out. So there was a lot of rhetoric uh, around, you know, player safety and, and the, the neg negative side effects of playing this great game. And as a player, hearing basically one side of this conversation, you're starting to look around the locker room going, are we broken? Like, should we be playing this sport? So I left the NFL with this kind of sad to admit that I didn't want my own children, my own boys playing football when they became of age because of kind of the things that I went through, the concussions I had that were documented, the, the concussions that weren't, weren't documented. Um, and there were definitely a lot more of those, but um, I got reconnected with uh, a guy who played at Arizona State kind of a generation before me. He was in the NFL as I was going to college. And when I was going to the NFL, he was coming out of the league. Um, Scott Peters, who is now the Patriots offensive line coach. He spent the last four years as the assistant offensive line coach with the Cleveland Browns. Um, but at, at the end of my NFL career, he had started really the nuts and, and bolts of, of this program um, because the end of his career, he was – kind of looking for ways to stay in shape as most guys do and found like jujitsu as like a, a, a way to learn new information that kind of spoke to leverage and, you know, the, the, the competition that guys are at that level are always seeking. And he really took that craft of the martial arts and was kind of blown away with principles of leverage that he thought, man, I could apply this to football, but I've never had a football coach teach it this way so we came up with a curriculum that was really just performance based hey i want to create better performing linemen and he went and kind of tested it up the university of washington back in like 2013 and that the the huskies team that year went on to uh so he spent a couple of weeks with the o-line and d-line and they went on to set school records and points scored rushing yards they were number two in the nation in sacks but about a month after the season uh, their athletic trainer said, "Hey, we had zero concussions this year, which is at that at that time like was pretty unheard of." So he kind of he had this epiphany of going, "If I can create a better performing player that is more confident and skilled with their contact skills, it's going to yield safety benefits." Because we came from the generation where coaches were telling us to use our face mask or helmet as a tool for contact. Now, over the past decade, you know, fifteen years, there's been a movement to use different language but some of the technical aspects were, were left with gaping holes so coaches were saying hey don't use your helmet use your hands but the methodology for teaching uh, blocking for instance um, was still yielding a lot of helmet contact um, while we have had a lot of success at the youth and high school level um, bringing this information sprinkling in college and pro teams here and there um, but when Scott in 2020 got asked to go out, really was going to just go out and work with the Browns offensive line because he has a relationship with uh, Bill Callahan, who had been in Washington and Dallas before using some of these drills and techniques and went out there and the coaching staff and the management kind of fell in love with how detailed this information was. And, you know, the Browns offensive line for a lot of years was going through coaching staffs every year, every other year, and they were able to make really was outside of Joe Thomas. You had a couple of good guys here and there, but it wasn't viewed as one of the best offensive lines in, in, in football. And over the past four years, you know, the Browns are, have been at the top of the league, you know, top five of rushing yards, um, given up a few less sacks and the performance has elevated based on this instruction. But what's really cool is uh, the NFL has been doing this independent study with uh, this medical group, um, where they put accelerometers in the helmets of all the offensive linemen across the entire league. And for three consecutive years of them doing the study, the Browns came back with the fewest hits to the head. And so our program is really based off of let's make better football players by teaching contact in a different setting, a more detailed setting, so we can optimize practice time, but then 
on the other side of that is you have less guys getting hurt, which, you know, like for, for me, it's like, had I learned these techniques at a young age and used them for my majority of my career, would that have extended my career longer? Possibly. But really it's, it's the, the mission of football, just like yourself has given us so much. It's such a great outlet for boys, helping them navigate the world today, giving them a positive aggressive atmosphere because this game is violent but we need that controlled aggression for boys as they mature into respectable men and this program has helped you know get more kids in, engaged so at the lower levels the high school and youth levels we've been able to increase help programs in patient because parents number one concern especially at the youngest level is safety like they, they they hear and read the headlines uh, and go, wow, football's too dangerous, so I shouldn't put my kid in it. Well, without going into a whole uh, another conversation, like the anti-football movement is backed by people with a lot of different interests that are trying to line their pockets in a different manner by by making people afraid of football. But we've proved that we can keep football an aggressive, physical sport while drastically making this game safer. Now, Coach, I know you're going to talk about this here more in a minute, but the tip of the spear strike system has a series of letters and numbers that really kind of guide an offensive lineman into what type of technique they need to use when they are going about pass protection or whatever type of block they're delivering. So when it comes to high school or collegiate type of athletes and programs, how extensive should they get with teaching these different letters and number combinations? What would be the most appropriate number and what would the teaching progression be for those type of things? Yeah, I, and I think one of the, the two of the biggest things that I love about teaching tip of the spear is the first one is everything we teach has a why behind it. Um, I grew up with a lot of coaches that gave me like the dad adage of do it this way because I said so. And you're just like, yes, sir. And just you did it because that's what you were told. Well, in this day and age where we have information at our fingertips, like coaches who are able to speak, or to, who are able to understand like, hey, I have two different players. I can say the same message over and over and over again, but you know, there's going to be times where player B doesn't respond the exact way as player A. So part of this isn't, Hey, we're telling coaches teach football this way. It's, Hey, here's different ways that you can accomplish the same goal. Your job as the coach is to take that information and learn how to maximize each individual athlete on your team. And so our strike system really, it, it, it helps coaches, get the most out of their players. Cause what we've really seen is at the high school level, especially, you know, the youth football kids are still learning. There's a higher emphasis on running the ball, but when you get to the high school level, especially today's day of football, uh, there's a priority on, on teams that can throw the ball and be able to protect the quarterback. But what we see with high school linemen all over the country is we see this reactionary system, you know, in the run game, they're told, Hey, put your hand on the ground, go hit this guy and drive until you hear the whistle and take him five more yards beyond that. But pass protection is more of a controlled aggression, right? You're kind of going backwards. You don't get to see the ball. You maybe understand where the quarterback is lining up, but you're taking on an opponent who's coming full speed. And in most situations, that guy's a better athlete. So what ends up happening is you end up essentially playing basketball where it's like, Hey, you're just guarding the hoop. Where, where is he going to go? And it becomes very reactive and reactive players are not very consistent. And so what our strike systems aim is to help players become and feel more confident and become more proactive in, in the past game. Um, is it cool if I sh share my screen and, and go Absolutely. from there? Yep. All right. A couple of slides that kind of help uh, demonstrate what, I, what I'm explaining. Uh, There we go. Right. So when when a player hears a, a, a pass call in, in the huddle, you know, say two jet and, and for most places two jet would be kind of a half slide protection where the right side is big on big and the center sliding left, trying to take the most dangerous three to that side. Um, if I'm on the big side, if I'm the right guard, right tackle, you know, I, I'm going to hear two jet in the huddle and go, oh, I have that guy. And maybe I've done some game planning without the week and maybe I've just revert back to the training. And I use this term cadence for contact and in pass protection. A lot of linemen get ingrained. They hear set hut and they have this timer, whether they hear it in their head or not, it, they react to a kick, kick, punch. 
So the, a lot of players get in this reactionary mode where they're just following a general protocol that they've been training. Well, we want to act way more independently because there's a lot of different things. You know, the, the defensive lineman is going to give us different rushes. He's going to use his hands in different ways. But often offensive linemen are taught a singular way to strike, a punch, a strike, whatever you call it. It's generally focusing on like the sides of the breastplate is, is one of the most stereotypical uh, points of reference for a coach to teach a player where to strike. What we're saying is this strike system, when I hear two jet based on the scheme, based on the situation, based on who I'm going against, I can cultivate a game plan, almost like a, a software for my play individually. Now there's some subjectivity to this, but the goal is based on, you know, at the high school level, um, a lot of this, the higher up you go, you have more time to install different types of angles, different types of sets, different types of strikes. So this can be as detailed or as watered down as you need it. But again, the goal here is for the player to have a proactive uh, operating system bait for every play. Um, so we use a, a combination of a letter, which defines what type of set I'm taking and a number code that kind of prepares me for what I'm planning, to, how to use my hands. We teach independent strikes um, at high school. Offensive linemen generally fall in one of two categories. We call them leaners or catchers. Guys who are overly aggressive, they go in with a two-end punch, their upper body's leaning, they get their hands knocked down, they get beat real easy. A catcher is somebody who sets more deep vertical off the ball, is more passive, and is just trying to absorb the rusher and basically wrestle him until the ball gets off. That human pincushion method is very inconsistent as well. So with our, our, our numbering, our letter codes for our sets, it's all based off like what you have in your program. So, you know, most high school coaches outside of, you know, like a sprint out, a bootleg, naked, like a straight drop back, they're going to likely teach one type of set. So this might seem like a lot of different sets, but like this is just an example of how detailed you can be. Um, because, you know, in the NFL, offensive line coaches have preferences on how they like to set. You know, the Browns for a number of years, they were doing a lot of what we call angle A or really short sets. They're trying to shave space off. They were a big wide zone team. So they wanted some of their drop back, uh, that, that initial get off to look you know, cause some confusion in the defensive line, help slow down some of that rush. Um, the majority of football programs are somewhere in this angle B category of a 45 degree set. Some coaches prefer what we call angle C, which is more of a vertical set. Um, but then we throw in some other situational sets. A jump set could be used in a short pass game, a three-step drop, a bubble screen, um, could be in like a run fake, um, a post set where you're setting inside and then an up kick is something that I personally don't teach so many high school kids because it's 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 like a jump set, but you're you're advancing with your outside leg and your outside pillar, long arm, um, try, trying to disrupt the timing of the rusher. Um, it's really used for higher levels when I'm talking to college coaches and, and working with NFL guys. Um, but we take that letter and we mix it in with our, our strikes. So rather than just two hands, a big aspect of what we teach it was tip of the spear and it's where our namesake comes from is this pillar strike. So rather than striking with the thumb up, we teach players to rotate the thumb out 45 degrees um, because when you rotate your thumb outside 45 degrees, it, it tilts the, the ulna and it aligns the ulna to be directly in between the lunate, the, the most dense part of our palm, which we call the tip of the spear and our, the humerus. So this slight rotation of the thumb when I land it long, I essentially am creating a skeletal spear. My lunate bone, ulna, humerus are all stacked over each other, and I can Im I can impact with a lot of force to my opponent with minimal effort on my on my behalf. And for years, coaches emphasize pushing and pressing, um, but we're trying to strike with a purpose. So it's not just getting our hands on it, right? The old first touch wins uh, kind of conversation that has been around offensive line for for generations yeah we want to touch the guy we want to get a handle as soon as we can but the way we place our hands on our opponent will dictate what effect it has to their rush so this pillar strike a one is an outside pillar so if i'm a right side player would be my right hand uh two would be my inside pillar so if i'm a left side player a one would be my left hand or two would be my right hand 
this pillar strike is designed to rotate and turn the plane of the shoulders of the defender. Um, if you've ever been around a defensive line practice, you've likely seen them run hoop, the hoop drill where they're trying to run this tight arc because in their mind, they're trying to take the path of least resistance from the line of scrimmage to the quarterback. And if you can deviate the plane of their shoulders and you can open and widen it, their rush lane is going to wider naturally. And generally speaking, we want to create width and make those guys go the long way. And so this pillar strike is a, is a more precise but effective tool than just a normal, Hey, get your hands, kick, kick, punch. Um, and so this would be uh, a way to do it. And there's a, a video example that's been rolling through there. Our number three strike is what we call an under. And it's more of a fit than a strike because you're not really throwing uppercuts. But the goal is you're trying to catch the bottom of the chest plate while bringing the elbow of that arm to as close to your center line as possible. Because as the defender kind of rushes into you, bull rushes, or just has natural power running into you, that elbow against your torso creates a buttress to help redirect his force upward and, and elevates his spine angle, right? The more we can elevate the spine angle of the defender, the weaker we can make him. And so the understrike is very effective against guys who like to bring vertical pressure. The downside is it, it's not very good for lateral movement. So if you got a guy who – isn't going to run down the middle of you and he's really focusing on hitting one of your edges and understrike wasn't, isn't going to be the most effective tool. In that case, we would move to our, our number four strike, which is called a clamp. So again, it's, it's not a strike. You're almost like catching the outside shoulder cap to the side that you're trying to prevent. So we'll see a lot of guys on a short set where they're trying to close that space and touch the guy either with an, uh, a, a one pillar with their outside hand or maybe a three because they're trying to take away a bull like this left guard on this video but we're also trying to take away that quick inside move so this clamp allows us to really dictate you know hey i want to be proactive with where you're going right i know the snap count as the offensive lineman i know where the quarterback should be lining up i know roughly the cadence of you know the duration of how this how long this play should last so I want to be able to be proactive and dictate where this rusher goes. Now, there's going to be times to refit and counter and, and throw in some different um, counter moves based on how he counters the stoppage. But our goal um, is I want to I want to have a say so where this guy goes. It's not it's not inverted where I'm clueless and just kind of scared going, hey, it's third and long. He could go anywhere. Where What should I do? It's no, 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 no. It's third and long. Here's the protection. This is the guy I'm going against. Here's how I'm going to beat him. Now let's go execute. Um, this clamp strike, we have a lot of tackles who love to set uh, in the bottom left a B14. So a B would be a 45-degree set. A one would be the outside pillar. And then a four would be inside clamp. So you're essentially funneling the rusher and saying, if you're going to beat me, you got to beat me down the middle. You're going to have to overpower me because I'm taking away your, I'm, I'm widening you with the outside pillar and I'm taking away the, your ability to, to quickly move inside with the inside clamp and, and, and put the ball in, in your court say, Hey, you want to beat me? You got to figure out how to push me back. Cause with a one and a four, I become vulnerable down the middle. Now, if a guy goes to, a bull rush, I can refit that one four and regain control. I maybe go from a four to a three to, to stop some of that vertical pressure. I can hop. There's a lot of different tools that we teach um, for, for that instance. But again, there is some subjectivity to this. So it's not a, hey, on three jet, here's an example of, of kind of a pre-snap of three jet. The left guard, left tackle are big on big. The guard's got the two eye, the center sliding to his right for the most dangerous three. But it's not, hey, on three jet, the left tackle always has this. The, the right, the left guard always has this combination. It can be based off of what your players do really well, right? And we've found by increasing and, in, you know, detailing the different strikes, it, it gives players something specific to think about and their consistency becomes a lot higher. If you just go out there and go, hey, I've got this end, I've got this two eye, there's a lot of room for, for thinking, right? And 
players who play at a high level, there isn't a lot of thinking, right? They understand what's the situation, what do I have to do? And they're more, their focus is on the process, not the result. And so by detailing and giving myself a specific game plan for this pass protection, I'm going to be focused on the process. I'm going to okay, keep the left guard. I'm posting with a 43, right? So my outside hand is protecting the, the – so my left hand right here is to the near shoulder, the near clamp, and my inside hand is going under. I'm, I, I understand I have – you know, I, I, I mentioned that the under – doesn't protect from lateral um, lateral pressure. So I've, I've protected my outside gap with the, 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 the clamp with my left hand, but I know I have the center to my right. And a good center isn't just going to deviate and go right to the three technique, right? If there's no pressure right here, there's no sign. That you can see the safety speed at the top. There's no signal here that says, hey, the center is going to bail, right? So a good center is going to set and kind of just hold space until he can help late. So the left guard knows that he has some help from his center. And so I don't have to necessarily be worried about that. I have to be worried about him kind of jetting and bull rushing through that A gap. So I'm going to use something in my mind that is going to take away his best rush. Now I can change some of this stuff up. Same thing with the right guard. It's an A13. So he's going, you know, pillar with his right hand. He's got the under with his left hand. Um, he's not going at A14 because he knows the center's coming with him, right? So he wants to take away what's what's the most immediate threat based off of the scheme. So the strike system allows for um, – it could be as detailed. You know, it, do we teach – like the, why – you know, a, a coach might ask me, why is the right guard setting A and the right tackle is setting with a B? Well, you know what, this may be third down and we want the tackle setting a little deeper because he might be, you know, hey, they've shown from this set, they've got a, a two eye, almost a nose to the field. We might get some sort of pressure from the field or there might be some sort of twist that I have to pass off. So I'm going to set a little deeper to be able to handle maybe that TE from the guy with the number two over his head. Um, so I can make this as detailed, but at the very end of the day, it allows my players to play precise and be more consistent. Um, and there, there's a, there's a small learning curve at the beginning. Um, I'll get out of here. There's a small learning curve with, you know, Hey, what is these letters and numbers mean? And then for players who have not really developed the different strikes, they've only been taught, you know, just touching like the pads on the wall where they strike a hundred times or the heavy bags, they haven't developed these individual skills. It's like, okay, well, let's spend drills working the pillar strikes. Let's spend drills working clamps and unders. And how do we put these together? How do we go from a pillar clamp, a one four to a bull rush pressure? How do I learn how to respond with a hop and a refit with that under um, so you kind of teach the individual parts and then you put them together, teach the, the sequences, the progressions, and then you put it into a competitive environment and then kind of see where the deficiencies still lie. And so one of the methods, like how we train is very reminiscent to, you know, like the mixed martial arts world where, you know, a lot of this ideologies came from. You watch a guy getting ready for a UFC pay-per-view event. You want go watch his fight camp. He's not in the, the ring sparring with an opponent for the majority of, of his training session. He's dissecting the individual pieces of his game. He's working on his grappling. He's working on his submissions. He's working on his striking. Then he'll put and package pieces, combinations together, and then go test it and refine it. Football obviously is a team sport. There's a lot more moving pieces. Each period in practice is thought about well in advance. And if some adversity hits and we have to shorten and take out a period, likely it's an uh, individual period, right? And so offense alignment specifically, you know, in the off season is a great time to be developing these skills and working on this these at lower tempos where you don't have the physicality of having pads on for most people. Um, it allows greater development because, you know, I think back to when I was in high school a long time ago, it was, Hey, I'm going to lift and eat and lift and run and eat. And, and like, I wasn't really working on my craft outside of football season. Now, a lot of these kids, you know, 
at least the ones that we've been around, like there's a, a growing number of kids that are kind of staying sport specific. Not a big fan of that. I think multiple sports at younger ages is beneficial, but there's opportunities to work on these different skills, even at, at the high school level um, where you're packaging development and prioritizing development. Um, so when you get into those team situations, because, you know, those team situations, you have 10, maybe 12 plays scripted. Uh, and, you know, when a play's done, times at, at, time is our most precious commodity. We got to get to the next play. I don't have a lot of time to wait for my offensive line coach to, to coach up five different mistakes or three different mistakes on a given play. It's like, hey, hey, that was good. That was bad. And so the player doesn't really – grow in practice in a team period the you know it's good to have team periods because it's good to see everything put together but that's not where development you know the kids that need that growth they need the time to break those pieces those skill sets down to smaller components and so when we're get, when we begin to game plan get ready for a week i as a player i understand hey on three jet based on my position I'm looking at a, a couple different factors this week. Okay. What is the alignment that might, is, might be based off of their base defense, their third down defense. Um, it, the, so alignment and opponent mixed in with the scheme is going to dictate a lot of how we teach this system. Um, but it's not, it's not necessarily going to be the same rubber stamp from program A to program B. And that's one of the things that I think has made our program so successful is coaches can come to us and and we're not, you know, we don't hit people over the head and be like, hey, we're, we played the NFL, you didn't, so listen to us. Like, that's a terrible mindset. Most offensive linemen that played in the NFL, like, we're the most humble, I mean, it's the most humble position in football. And and, and it comes with kind of when, when coaches reach out and have conversations with us, they quickly realize, hey, we're, we're here to help you. And so if there's a different way to do this, let's talk about it and discuss it. Because our program continues to evolve um, and – but to be able to see this type of system be highly effective and, you know, Coach Peters with the Patriots, like every offseason, he's got coaches from the other NFL teams going, hey, I heard you're doing this with your pass protection. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? I'm, I'm kind of spreading the word like gospel. It, it's like uh, throughout like the college ranks. College coaches are calling me left, right. Hey, this coach over here had a lot of success with it. Tell me about it. How do I implement it with what I'm doing? Well, we teach this. We teach it this way. We don't really use those words. I'm like, I don't care what words you use. It doesn't matter to me. I want you to have success because I want I want your players having a good experience. Because unfortunately, I have a lot of former teammates, friends that left football not under their terms, and so they they a lot of players leave this game with a sour taste in their mouth. And I refuse to to spend the rest of my life going, "Hey, football did me wrong." Like this game has transformed my life, my family's life beyond the monetary benefits of playing the NFL, right? The, 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 the character traits, the perseverance that I've learned, like I want more players to experience that and to take that away, but it's also fun to kick somebody's ass on the other side of the line, right? There, you, you can't go to the grocery store and, and pancake somebody into the bananas that like you leave in hand in, in handcuffs. So like an outlet to have for this aggressive sport is beautiful, but we can teach it in a way that isn't just detrimental to the health of our players. Now, Coach, when it comes to running backs, what would be the advice that you would give for how to use tip of the spear when it comes to running backs and pass protection? So running backs and pass protection, I think, has got to be next on my list because it is hard to find quality block on film. Um, but honestly, we spend more time focusing on, you know, different hand fits than necessarily a the strike system itself. So you know most most uh, most um, running backs in pass protection when they're picking up a blitz, it's a car crash. It, it's a head on and and their helmet gets used way more than it should be. So there's some coaches who teach shoulder contact. We'll teach them how our method for shoulder contact that offsets the head that delivers a great amount of force. Um, and then we'll teach them pillar strikes. We'll teach them kind of, we call it bridge fits, more of a run blocking. But the, the goal is similar to the under where the elbows are inside the torso of the body. The hands are a little bit lower to create that lift. So it, it's more of changing 
their philosophy for how they strike con with contact versus the strike system because in most protections you know um if if their guy isn't coming like they're they're another route in in the protection you know like they're gonna leak late or they're gonna be a check down so like they've got another aspect to worry about than what we do up front so we found it's been most beneficial to teach the the the, the hand fits because it's not the the letter they're not going to be setting in the same manner you know they're going to be filling and inserting and you know they might have based on the protection you might they might be reading from one side to the other like there's a lot of more variability that they see than than kind of the the worlds that we live in in the, in the you know mic protection the man protection half slide full slide um, it, it's easier to to create boundaries for the offensive line if that makes sense. Now, Coach, when we're talking about game week, uh, whether it be for high school players or collegiate players, and we're looking at trying to implement this system in terms of a game plan, and we're looking at the different code system that you have for the offensive linemen. Let's imagine you're a guard and, and you're blocking like a three-tech, for example. How many different combinations would you carry into a given week for a lineman to block that three technique? And what are some of the things that you would practice and scaffold throughout the week to try to help that offensive line and be prepared to be successful on Friday nights. Absolutely. So like if we, if we use that example, a guard against a three technique and he's in a man on the man side, you know, it's really, it's really going to be based upon who that opponent is you're going against, you know, like what does he do best? Let's figure out a, a, a plan that takes that away. But I also have to be kind of mindful of my own strengths and weaknesses. Like, so for me, for instance, I've got, I have short arms for an offensive lineman. So playing at length, like I had coaches that would teach me a double, like to strike with two hands. I was way better with a single arm because, in independent strikes because a one arm can touch a little bit sooner than two arms. Um, so knowing that I did not like to set vertical. Right. I don't want a lot of space. I, I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm quick. I'm strong, but I got short arms. So I want to go close the space as much as possible. So I, I like to set, I like to jump set, short set. Um, but your player, it, it's really the, the, the complex thing is when you look at all of these different numbers and letters, like mathematically, you can come up with a significant amount of different combinations. But really, it's a pillar, it's a clamp, it's an under. There's really three different types of strikes. Now, the side that you use it is based on where you're trying to get the guy to go, but it's really three different strikes. And in most high school situations, you're going to have your base kick set, whatever that is, whatever angle that is. Um, you might have a jump set and you might have a post set, right? So you're, you're really thinking most people are going to be factoring in three different angles, three different strikes, now, based off of the guy, if I'm going against a really light defensive lineman, I might be a, a, a 14 the entire game, you know, a pillar and a clamp. I'm not worried about a bull rush. If he pushes me back, I can hop, I can brace it. There's a lot of different things. But if I'm going into a guy who's, hey, this is a four or five star kid, he's going to Alabama and, you know, he's got everything in the books, like, you know what? I'm not going to try to overload that player with a thousand different combinations. I might be trying to protect him a different way with our protection. You know, like there's probably not going to be too many times where I want him one-on-one -on -one with one of my guys. I'm going to try to create double teams with different types of protections, moving the quarterback, et cetera. Um, so that's one of the things that, that we've heard from like, college and NFL guys when they come and, and we teach it to them, they first look at it and it's like this, overwhelming sight of all these letters and numbers and how does it make sense? And it's like, Hey, take a deep breath. What's our objective. We have a guy who can rush us outside down the middle or inside. We have to get to a specific spot with our body, whether that's a, a kick set, a B or C, are we closing space with a jump with, or with a post? And then how are we using our hands based off of what do we want him to do? So it can look daunting at first glance, but when a player understands like, it's really not that much. They can operate a lot faster. And that's why I said the, the learning cur curve is very quick because once you get past that initial, what do all these things mean? 
well, they don't have to all mean everything to you, right? You've probably seen some high school playbooks that look as big as an NFL playbook. And I work with some of these schools. And I'm like, hey, can, do you need all of this? Like, are, are you having success with all of this? Or you just have it because you want it in your back pocket? Well, if that's the case, because I mean, I, I coached high school when I got done, I was OC. Like, I get it. I get the love of going, hey, here's a new play that's going to dice the defense. And this is what we're going to do. Cool. But try to keep everything in specific buckets. Like here's our zone bucket. Here's our gap bucket. Here's our, you know, our, our specialty runs, our man plays, ISO, have you. Pass protection is the same. Okay. If we're on a full slide, we're not leaving. We're not leaving space that I got some on my backside to go look for color this way. Like we're, we all are going to hold space with our body, understand how to use our hands. And that way we become more confident and then confidence leads to the consistency. Now, Coach, as we're wrapping up here, if coaches are looking for more information on Tip of the Spear, where can they find more information? Yes, our website, tosfb.com. We have video libraries that we have instructional and drill videos. We offer a free 30-day trial for anyone that signs up. Um, we have coaching certifications. We do in-person clinics and uh, camps. Um, we're trying to give different resources, meet, meet coaches where they're at, help them with the needs that they have. Um, but TOSFB.com is the best way to reach us.